All right, let's get started. Uh, this is the week one content for Laramie County Community College's Introduction to Photography course. Uh, I'm your instructor, Jay O'Brien. I'm going to talk to you briefly. It's a short lecture this week. Mostly, I want to get you guys kind of acclimated and just kind of started with things, uh, reading the syllabus, uh, asking me questions, getting cameras checked out. But uh, we're also going to do just kind of a, a a little lecture kind of the history of photography and we're looking at the history of photography mostly as a context to examine uh, camera anatomy and how uh, the, the technology works just to begin to illuminate that uh, and really it's pretty incredible because uh, the history of photography is it's, it's really happened so quickly um, so uh, we'll look at a little bit of history I'll uh, show you, um, we're going to discuss like, a little bit of camera anatomy looking at the SLR again, uh, and it shouldn't uh, be a, a really heavy lecture. Now one of the things I wanted to let you guys know uh, is that, you know, uh, this lecture, I'm, I'm not going to be one of those instructors that's like, you know, in what year did, you know, so-and-so discover that, you know, silver, silver salts uh, would uh, darken with exposure to light, you know, stuff like that. And I apologize, my lamp just kind of went in and on and out. And, and anyway, I'm not going to be one of those, like, you know, quizzing you on dates kind of instructors. So uh, I'm mostly looking at this from the context of just how uh, quickly the, the, the technology has moved. And to give you guys some background as to, you know, what uh, cameras, uh, well, what, what photography is and how cameras have kind of developed. I'm going to go ahead and go to my screen share here really quick. Okay, and I'm going to go into Introduction to Photography and then our content. And our history of photography. All right. Okay, so uh, one of the first things, oh, you know what? I didn't share that the right way. Let me, that's not going to be very clean for you guys. Let's get this so that it's a little nicer. There we go. That's nicer. Okay, so uh, while we've only had uh, the technology to actually affix and create images, you know, uh, keep images for the last couple of hundred years a lot of the technology that has gone into uh, creating photographs actually goes back uh, for a, a couple of centuries um, and it's there's a couple there's some different uh, examples of different uh, models of cameras uh, and some of them we're looking back as far as fifth century BC and the first types of cameras, if you want to call them that kind of quote unquote cameras, um, well, I mean, I guess they are cameras regardless. I, what I'm just talking about here, the reason why I'm kind of hedging back and forth is because of the ability to actually fix images. Basically, we had the ability to harness light to project an image with these early forms of cameras but we couldn't actually record an image. Uh, now, the term camera comes from this early term uh, for one of the early camera bodies that we had, and it was called the camera obscura, and it literally translated to darkened room or darkened chamber. And we'll actually look at a, a video uh, in the upcoming weeks that actually shows you how you can still actually make a camera obscura. And when we talk about a darkened chamber, uh, the reality is, is that some of these early cameras were enormous. The camera obscura was not this small thing like we have today that we uh, walk around with and, and capture images with. Uh, and, you know, darkened room, darkened chamber was, was the reality. I mean, even with the illustration that we see here is actually much smaller. And you can, you know, still create a camera obscura. So it projected images, but it did not capture images. Uh, first documented mention to any type of camera would be a pinhole camera, uh, and it was a Chinese philosopher. Uh, and then 
we had uh, the camera obscura, which was created uh, many, many years later. So pinhole cameras, uh, we actually had to, uh, kind of discovered long before we then began to evolve that model into something that was a little bit more usable, like the camera obscura. So, but still, uh, it didn't capture images. So you can see here, the idea is that basically the light would come in through a hole in the front of the box. And this is a much more advanced box. It obviously has a lens. From some of the first camera obscuras didn't have lenses. And then the light would actually project into the box, projecting an image onto the back of the box. In this case, this model of camera obscura is actually designed uh, so that the project, the, uh, the, whatever it is, the light is then projected up so that someone can actually use that light to draw. And there's actually some, uh, argument that a lot of uh, realism that we saw in artwork uh, was actually as a result of camera obscura. So a lot of artists potentially were actually using camera obscura to create very realistic artworks before we had the ability to actually chemically uh, capture, record that light. It wasn't until uh, the you know the 1700s that we actually began to see some you know the, obviously there was a lot of uh, experimentation, but it was the 1700s when we began to see some developments uh, that would then later lead to photography. And I say would later lead to photography because a lot of the times one of the, some of the interesting things that we see about photography is that some of the advancements were not made by people necessarily who were actively pursuing creating a piece of technology that would create images. Many cases, they were actually working on technologies for other purposes. So um, like uh, advances in optics, in some cases were actually uh, advances in optics that we were seeing uh, for, you know, the purposes of, uh, eyesight correction or for creating a better microscope or telescope and then those advances in those optics uh, in optical technology would then be applied uh, to other areas like photography so but in 1725 we first have someone discovering that we can actually use particular types of chemicals that darken when they're exposed to light they, we still don't have photography because you know, we see this reaction of the silver salts with light, but we can't actually affix this. We can't make it, you know, it, it, it doesn't stay over time. And that's a big problem with the early chemistry and photography. Uh, 1958, we have some advances in optics, as you can see here. And so this is actually, you know, I was showing you that uh, illustration. I said that a lot of the early ones didn't have any optics. The reality is they're just boxes. So it wasn't until, you know, much later that we saw people actually taking advances in other te technologies, applying that to the camera obscura so that we could intensify, focus, and clarify the light that came through the front of the camera obscura. Uh, early 1800s, we see uh, some additional, uh, the different, there's, there's a number of different uh, chemical processes that people are experimenting with. And there's some similarities. We see a lot of you know, silver salts, silver nitrate. Uh, silver is obviously, you know, still used today. Uh, but different types of chemical reactions used to try to create images. Uh, so we have uh, Wedgwood is producing silhouettes on uh, on objects with this uh, silver nitrated uh, coated papers, but the images, they still fade uh, in daylight. So again, we can create those and it's getting better, but it doesn't fix, it doesn't stay. Uh, now in uh, 1826, we have the first uh, permanent image, and that's the image that you see in the lower left here. Okay, now this is, this is, it's a huge advancement, but there's a lot of 
improvements that need to be made. Okay, you know, one, you can see that the quality here, uh, you know, of this image is not fantastic. And then there's, there's a number of problems here. So not only is the quality not where we need to be, but then there's some problems with just, you know, the time that it amounts that it takes to do this. So this photograph, one of the interesting things about this photograph is you see here, as you look, this is actually taking out into uh, an alleyway, I believe. And you can see that the buildings are illuminated uh, both on the left hand side and on the right hand side. And that, you know, that doesn't seem like it really would make sense. Uh, how could we have illumination on both of those sides. And the reality is, is the, one of the reasons why we have uh, illumination on both of those sides is because of the extended period it took to expose this, expose this image, eight hours. So not very uh, practical yet, but still some, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, exciting advances. Now, like I said before, there were a number of different chemical processes that different people were working with at this time. And there was another gentleman, uh, Fox Talbot, who was working with another process, and he was actually uh, Napis. Uh, or I'm sorry, n n n <laughs> I, I always say I always want to say Napis. It's actually Nipsey. <laughs> sorry, there's too many of these names. Anyway, okay, so Talbot, uh, you know, uh, Nipsey's uh, process is actually he's creating a positive image. So one single unique image at a time. Talbot is actually the, uh, one of the first people who we see successfully working with a form of photography where we can actually reproduce. He's actually creating a technology that would, rec would create negatives. Uh, so basically a reverse of what we would see. And, and he's uh, seeing a lot of uh, support, uh, well, uh, success in 34 and 35. <clears throat> um, we have another gentleman who kind of enters in the uh, fold, and he actually uh, partners with the Nipsey family, and this is uh, Daguerre, uh, Louis Daguerre. So he's uh, and he's kind of an interesting character. He's a, a, not only is he interested in these new processes, not really a chemist, uh, scientist like some of these other folks, but an incredible marketer. In fact, he, b before he got interested in photography, uh, was actually uh, creating uh, these large, large dioramas and, uh, you know, uh, selling tickets for people to look at these large dioramas. So, uh, but he gets into the mix and starts to work with some of these uh, other folks, uh, the, the, the Nipsey family, uh, and he's start, he actually creates the first photograph in 1938 that has a person in it. Now, it's a really interesting photograph, and we're going to look at it on the next slide here. And this uh, would have been uh, 38, 39 in Paris, and it's a really busy street. Uh, but one of the things that we see in the photograph is that there's only one person in the photograph. We'll look at it here for, in just a moment. Uh, in 1839, uh, Daguerre, he's uh, you know kind of a brilliant uh, marketer, and he actually uh, convinces the Nipsey family to kind of release the technology uh, for general use, and they in return they get large. Uh, government pensions for this. So, uh, and it's actually Isidore uh, Nepsey who's working with him now. At the, uh, it, like I said, there was a, a number of people in that family who were working on the process. Here's that photograph, and as you can see, we have this, uh, what would clearly be a very busy street in Paris, but no one in the streets. And here's the, the gentleman down here and the lower left hand corner that you can see. And the only reason why we were able to see him in this photograph is because uh, he stopped to get his shoes shined. Uh, because, so one of the important things here to remember is that early in photography, early in these processes, it takes such a long time to create an image. So some types of photography are just not practical early on, uh, you know, like portrait photography, just because of the extended period of time that it takes to create the images. 
Uh, now, Fox Talbot knows that this has happened, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to uh, try to present the the research and the advances he's made. But unfortunately, it's too bad. It's too late. Uh, Daguerre has already kind of uh, captivated uh, people with his process and the first, really the first uh, commercially successful type of photography is a, t is a uh, technology of photography called the daguerreotype. Uh, so uh, while Talbot really kind of uh, was, uh, his process might have been a little bit more advanced in some ways because he's creating the ability to create many positive prints, uh, it doesn't have the acuity, the visual acuity that the daguerreotype has, but you know that ability to reproduce is pretty an exciting concept. But the daguerreotype uh, it becomes wildly uh, commercially successful, and you know, not many people really uh, talk about Fox Talbot, unfortunately. Uh, we have we finally uh, in, in, from eighteen. Uh, uh, 40s to, I'm uh, sorry, uh, this would have been uh, 1839 as well, I believe, where we finally have the term, you know, photography. We've coined that term. And then we have a number of contributions uh, to the chemistry. And then we also uh, have uh, another uh, important ad advancement in optics. And these advances in optics and chemistry from 1841 and 1851 uh, are important because it, they are going to decrease the amount of time that it takes to actually affix an image. So it's, instead of having the, you know, we started out with that eight hour uh, exposure time for that first photograph. And then even uh, Daguerre's scene in Paris where uh, it was much shorter, but uh, still so long that only one person is actually visible in the photograph. Uh, in 1861, we now see uh, our first color image. Now, it's, it's interesting to understand that it's not actually a, a, a color print. It's a color image. But we, we we're beginning to see people experiment with the idea that we want images that are actually color and not just achromatic or monochromatic. And the reason why I say achromatic and monochromatic is that uh, obviously a lot of the early... Uh, photographs were what we would call black and white, but there were actually other processes that weren't necessarily black and white. We actually even had a process that was called cyanotype, and it was called cyanotype because instead of being black and white, it was kind of cyan or blue and white. So there was a number of different processes, but this is the first uh, uh, experimentation that we have, uh, a successful experimentation with color images, and what it is is actually uh, a projection. Uh, so they actually are projecting uh, an opaque, or I'm sorry, a transparent material uh, with three projectors onto a screen, each of them a different color, uh, which now gives us the ability to see an image in color. It's called tartan ribbon because it's a tartan ribbon if you look at it. Uh, it's just a basic uh, kind of a plaid ribbon. In 1880, uh, we have a, a large a advancement. A lot of the advancements that we are going to look at uh, at this point, you know, the, the technology has improved to the point where we are able to create, really create images quite uh, effectively. Timing, the amount of time that it takes has been shortened a great deal. But now we're going to look at advancements that actually bring photography to the masses uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. So in 1880, we see the first photographic halftone. And what this means is that, you know, previously to, previous to this, uh, photographs in newspapers were not practical. We couldn't do it. The way we print uh, newspapers, uh, photographs didn't transfer well. There wasn't a way to do that. Uh, the artwork that appeared in newspapers were actually cut onto wood blocks. So illustrators would actually carve blocks that would then be used to uh, ink and transfer onto the paper for images. The halftone process takes photographs and turns it into a series of dots. So that's what halftoning does. It takes the photograph and it breaks it down into a whole bunch of dots. And those dots then can be used in the printing press process 
to then transfer ink, not in you know large black areas, but in a series of smaller dots to, to then create the image. In 1888, another uh, advancement that really brought things uh, to the mass, brought photography to the masses, is this Kodak Number no. One by George Eastman. And so now we finally have, uh, you know, previous to 1888, photographers were were uh, pretty specialized uh, tradesmen. Uh, you had to. You know, not only have a uh, large, expensive equipment, but in many cases, photographers themselves were actually uh, educated in chemistry so that they could process their own work. So it was it was not a simple process. It was a a, a, a pretty uh, arduous task to create images with a camera. The Kodak number one is the first camera that we now have available for the general public where you can buy a simple camera, and this is what it looked like down here. It's just a simple box, and the film is actually preloaded in the camera for you. And so uh, what you would do is you, you would take the photographs in the camera, and then when you were done, you would actually take the ca camera to the processing uh, er uh, service, and they would actually open up the camera, take the, the film out, process it for you, make prints for you, reload your camera with more uh, film so that you could uh, take more images and then return the whole works to you. So you didn't even have the ability to actually put uh, the photographic material into the camera. It had to be done uh, by a, a a chemist or, or a processing uh, house, uh, and that's actually another uh, interesting thing. Is uh, you know the, the advancements of uh, here in the 1940s. It says we're going to talk about it uh, where uh, we we have la factories who take over for uh, individual chemists who are uh, processing film. Uh, in 1804, we see some more advancements with color photography, uh, but uh, still, uh, you know, we're, we're still developing this, but we have film that is uh, becoming sensitive to other uh, colors of light as opposed to just the entire array of light and producing a black and white image. Again, in the 1940s, we see these factories that take over film processing uh, instead of, you know, a, a neighborhood chemist. Uh, and... Then in 1847, we have the first instant photograph process. So, you know, uh, and of course, it's uh, from uh, Edwin, Dr. Edwin Land with Polaroid Land. And, uh, you know, the, basically the chemistry has been uh, put into layers with the other photographic uh, materials. So after you take the photograph uh, and run the... Uh, the material through the camera, the chemistry then interacts and creates an instant image. Uh, we in 1863 uh, we have uh, instant color photographs as well. Now this is a pretty interesting thing to me that I think a lot of people uh, would take for granted. Uh, in 1976, we have the first camera with a microprocessor in it. So uh, that's a pretty uh, interesting advancement. Uh, so, the, you know, we're, we don't have at this point any cameras that do things automatically. We have simplified cameras that you don't have to necessarily focus, but it's mostly based on the idea of uh, having a depth of field that's so wide that you don't have to focus. Not necessarily that you know uh, that there is no focusing mechanism. So uh, the putting having a camera that has a microprocessor in it really opens up a lot of different possibilities. Uh, one of which is in the 1980s we finally have uh, cameras uh, that will actually read the film speed for you. So. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about something called ISO as we get into this class, but uh, your cameras shoot at different sensitivities. And previous to the 1980s, you would actually have to tell your camera, I am shooting X speed film. 
Uh, so like when we talked about the in the welcome video, I'm asking you guys to get uh, 400 Team X 400 film. You would actually, and we still actually have to do this with some of our cameras. Tell the camera, I am shooting 400 ISO film. Well. In the 1980s, uh, so one of the things that we were able to do is they started putting coating on the film. So some cameras, uh, and you may have one, will actually read and sense the coating on the film, and they will set the it then sets the ISO that your camera will shoot at automatically. Uh, in 18, uh, 1984, we, uh, Canon demonstrates the first digital camera. It's important there that it says demonstrated because this was not a, uh, a commercial uh, success uh, necessarily. Uh, they're, they're inventing, they're experimenting, but the camera itself is actually uh, the size of a large room uh, and is basically can only take photographs of something that you put in front of it. So not uh, terribly practical at that time. In 1985, Minolta gives us our first autofocus camera, the first uh, autofocus SLR, which is pretty uh, incre incredible uh, uh, to think that we didn't have autofocus before that. So cameras before that uh, used uh, a number of systems. You either had to manually focus, you measured your focus by distance, or uh, your camera was set up in such a way that it was creating a very wide depth of field so that you never had to, or deep depth of field so that you didn't have to think about focus. So if you think back to any camera that you used, and I know I probably have young people here that weren't alive in 1985, uh, but I, you know, uh, remember using cameras that, that you didn't have a focus system on the camera. You just took the photograph, and the because of the conditions, and we'll learn more about depth of field in this class. Uh, we always had a very deep depth of field, so you never really had to worry about focus. Uh, 1986, we have the first megapixel camera uh, in a 1.4 megapixel, and which is you know kind of silly to us today. Uh, it cost tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, uh, wasn't uh, uh, per particularly practical. Uh, 1990, we have uh, Adobe Photoshop 1.0 uh, released uh, only for Macintosh computers. Uh, now, uh, photo Photoshop's been around for uh, quite some time now. I think it just celebrated its 25th anniversary. I'm guess I, last it would have been last year. Uh, and then in 1998, the first consumer megapixel camera uh, was introduced. Now, uh, this is a pretty important thing. I mean, this is, so what this means is that the first time, uh, for, for the first time, uh, the average you know, consumer could go out and get a digital camera. Now, uh, these were not great digital cameras. Uh, we actually had one at Ultra C when I was a student here. Uh, it was a half of a megapixel. It cost about $1,000. It would take eight images uh, uh, before it ran out of memory, uh, and the shutter lag was just ridiculous. It took forever to take a photograph. So you could use it to create some images, but there were a number of images that just were not practical with it. So uh, still, you know, we, we have this uh, technology, and, you know, people are starting to use this for the first time. It's very exciting, but uh, lots of things uh, to uh, improve upon it. I actually had my first uh, digital camera in uh, 2000. I had a one megapixel Hewlett Packard. Um, I always try to give uh, sources at the uh, ends of these uh, where I remember where I've gotten some of these things from. So that's a basic, uh, you know, look at uh, history of photography. And, uh, and like I said, it's it's just kind of it's uh, I, I think it's interesting just to see how quickly that technology has moved. I mean, it's just you know, basically things like autofocus, uh, uh, microprocessors and cameras, these are things that have happened in my lifetime. And no jokes, because you know, I'm only 41, so that's that's not that long. Uh, of course, that does mean that some of these things have happened just within my lifetime. But let's talk a little bit about uh, camera anatomy, basic uh, uh, single lens reflex uh, camera anatomy. And, and I'll probably go over this a number of times in different ways. And that's a good thing because that means hopefully you're actually going to get it. So uh, again, I showed you uh, it was actually a different model of uh, 
SLR uh, before. It was a Pentax MZM. This is a Pentax K1000, and this is actually the camera, uh, the model of camera that I learned to use when I was first in, in college. And I, I, I got to think I used one of these when I was in high school as well, but my memory is just not that great. My parents actually bought one of these for, for me for Christmas when I was in college one year. I, they used to cost like, you know, about 200 bucks. Uh, and it's just about the most stout camera. You could beat the heck out of somebody with this and then take photographs when you're done. Uh, so let's kind of take a look at it. One of the reasons why we call it a single lens reflex camera is because of the way the camera is designed. You actually see through the lens, and through the lens is actually uh, a term that you'll hear a lot. There's a lot of technologies that we will say are through the lens or TTL. Okay, so what happens with a single lens reflex camera is the light is going to come in through the lens. And then if you look closely here, you can see there's actually a mirror in there. You can actually get a pretty good look at it. And what happens is the light is comes through the, the lens, hits that mirror, bounces the, the image upward into this portion of the camera. And this is called a pentaprism. Okay, and uh, that's a fancy word that means the image is going to bounce around a whole lot and then it's going to come out of the viewfinder up here where we're looking. Okay, so the reason why that's important is because you don't have to necessarily guess what you're going to get with the, you know, there's, there's not like a, a differentiation between what you're looking at and what you're gonna what you're gonna get on, on, on the film uh, now there are a couple of other popular models of camera uh, for shooting film uh, we have uh, the re the rangefinder and we have the twin lens reflex and I actually have a if you look right here and here those are twin lens reflex cameras right up behind me this is a old Kodak it's actually part of the Brownie line, and that's a Minolta auto cord right there, which is actually a pretty decent camera. The, but with a twin lens reflex, you can see it has, they each have two lenses. The lens on the top is used for viewfinding, so you look and see what, you know, what your image is. You actually look down through it, and then it projects out. And then the, the lens on the bottom is where the actual film is exposed. So you're not necessarily looking exactly at the image. It's a little bit off. Uh, not to say that they're bad cameras. They're, in fact, some of them are fantastic cameras. And a lot of uh, celebrated uh, photographers through history have used different models of cameras. Uh, we're, uh, we use SLRs for a number of reasons. And I'll talk about some of those reasons as we go through. It'll become evident more and more as we go through class. Um, range finders are uh, a model of camera that look fairly similar to a SLR, but again, you, but you don't actually have a pentaprism, and you, uh, you, don't, you uh, will have a viewfinder over here, uh, or possibly over here. There's different models that have them all over the uh, place. But you would actually look through the viewfinder that kind of lines up with the camera, and again, it's not quite the same thing. Um, some advantages and disadvantages, the, the things that I uh, really kind of uh, talk about where I favor an SLR and why we like to use SLRs for these classes, uh, one of the things is interchangeable lenses. Uh, twin lens reflex, you know, they, they pretty much are what they are. You can get some uh, lens attachments that give you some additional abilities. Uh, and then uh, the ability to control depth of field is actually, this is actually probably the strongest case I have for single lens reflex cameras. The ability to manipulate depth of field with a single lens reflex is much stronger than it is with some of these other models of cameras. Range finders and, uh, range finders are okay. They're pretty good at it, but, uh, because you can't, you know, you, you can't, uh, you know, there's no things, nothing like a depth of field preview. That's a bit of a disadvantage. And then also just uh, due to the mechanics of the camera, how the cameras and the lenses are designed, you actually will get you, the ability to have a shallower depth of field with a single lens reflex 
than you could uh, necessarily with a rangefinder. And for most people, uh, particularly photographers who are interested in, you know, uh, documentary photography and uh, artistic photography, the ability to control depth of field is pretty profound. Uh, one of the, some, there's some disadvantages to SLRs uh, in comparison to some of these other cameras. Uh, SLRs are probably one of the the, the more obtrusive lens, uh, models of cameras. Uh, they're not very stealthy. Not that you know. Well, I don't know. That that's a there's there's some case studies where people wanted to have a little stealth. Uh, maybe people with twins lens and lens reflex cameras. You kind of look down. So you, it may not even look like you're taking a photograph. Uh, range finders are very quiet, whereas you can hear an SLR, uh, just about any SLR model that you have is going to be fairly loud unless you're getting into uh, now a kind of an offshoot. I don't even know what to call it. We now have digital mo uh, cameras that are called mirrorless, and I... You know, they're kind of almost like a combination of the style of an SLR, but they're a bit more like a range finder. Uh, they're, there's a, they're, they're really an interesting model of camera that uh, I think are, are really fantastic. They uh, actually kind of take away some of the uh, disadvantages of an SLR and also the disadvantage of a range finder and put it kind of into one type of camera. Uh, but the, the SLR is what we use for this class. Uh, if you were going to shoot digital, you could shoot mirrorless. I would be okay with that. Uh, but you're you're going to have to have manual control. So things to look for when you're uh, shooting, when you're looking for a camera. Like I said, I have these to check out. I have a number of uh, K1000s and then a number of other models of camera. You may have a camera that you'd like to learn how to use. Uh, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, sister, cousin, somebody may have cameras. I, I actually look for cameras all the time at garage sales, pick them up for, you know, five to 25 bucks and, and they work fine. They work great. Uh, but uh, through the years, I have actually developed a pretty good stable of cameras to check out to students. So I can check one of these out to you. If you have one that you'd like to shoot with, that's great as well. But you need to look for manual functions. If we run into a camera, and I am going to ask you guys to kind of clear your cameras with me, if I run into a camera that doesn't have manual functions, then I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to shoot that camera because I want you to learn how to do things manually. Okay, so what, what does manual mean? Okay, we're going to talk in the next, uh, well, well, a little bit, quite a bit in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll continue the conversation the rest of the semester about uh, some of our basic functions of a camera, and that is shutter speed and aperture. Okay, so if you look at this camera here, and I'll hold it up there, we'll see how close we can get. You can see that dial with those numbers on it, that's the shutter speed. And there's not an automatic feature on this camera. This is a completely manual camera. It's one of the things I love about the K1000. Uh, other camera models that might work, they may still have an auto feature. In fact, this lens that I have on this camera, even though this camera body can't take advantage of it, it actually has automatic settings. So I'm going to hold that up there, and you can see those are the aperture. We have 2.84, uh, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, and then you can see it says A, Okay, and that would be automatic. On a body that actually will will shoot automatically, you can actually shoot. You can actually swing that uh, over to the A feature. It won't. Uh, yeah, there we are. I'm locked up on it right now, so I'm locked on A. It wouldn't do me any good on this camera. But what would happen is, is that uh, you would then be able to let the camera automatically set your aperture and compensate for your exposure. We'll talk about more about what that means next week, so don't, let's not get caught up on exposure just yet. Um, but I want you to be manually uh, doing everything with cameras, so we, you need to make sure that your camera has the ability to allow you to shoot manually. Okay, uh, so but let's look just a little bit more about what you know aperture uh, and shutter is. I'm going to 
you know, like I said, cover this over and over again. So aperture. Aperture is something that actually exists in the lens. Okay, The aperture is the opening of the lens. And if you look in there, you can actually see there's a little opening right there. And right now, this camera is that that right there. See, that's really small right now. That is an f22. As I move the aperture ring, you can see that it opens and closes. And we'll talk about what that really does, you know, uh, later. There's a number of reasons why we would want to have control of our aperture. But for right now, I just want you to, you know, be aware that that's one of the features we're looking for is the ability to manually change your aperture. The next thing, and I'll leave the lens off for this, is the ability to change our shutter speed. So uh, our shutter speed, again, right there, we can set it to be very fast or quite slow but we want to have the ability to actually change that uh, ourselves. Um, again, a number of reasons why we want to be able to have control of our shutter speed, uh, both for creating the correct exposure and then things we can do creatively, but we're going to get more into that next week. So uh, one of the things that I want you to be doing this week is to be determining what camera you are going to shoot for this class. Um, and uh, we'll have discussions. I'm probably going to put discussions in. Uh, not, I need to put a discussion in so that you guys can, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. We'll put in a discussion also for you guys to talk about the camera that you plan to use for the class. And if you would like to check out a camera from me, as I said, I have a number of film cameras. You need to uh, schedule an appointment with me, as it says in the uh, uh, online course space, so that you can come in and I can get a camera checked out to you. So uh, hopefully uh, this is getting you uh, curious about uh, what we can do with uh, photography. I know the history of photography is not always the most exciting things for folks, but I want to get you guys, uh, I want to give you a strong foundation because the point of this class is so that you understand the camera enough that you can start to do things with it that just were not possible for you before. All right. Uh, thanks a bunch. And uh, that's, I don't think I have any more videos that I'm going to be recording for you guys this week. So uh, this will be uh, all I, last time I see you until next week.